a thank you letter, a cable, a diary, a radio broadcast, and a military order, all in less than four minutes. A U.S. soldier jumped off the tank, opened the gates, and announced, you are free. To us, he and the others from the U.S. Army were angels from heaven. I was standing near the gate and tried to say thank you in English, German, or Hungarian, but no sound would pass my lips. The most astonishing thing I found was how wonderfully kind they were to us. How remarkable it was that under the dirt, the disease, the rags, and the lice, these soldiers could see human beings young girls. Their kindness and their thoughtfulness gave us back our belief in the human race. That was written in 1997 by Leah Fuchs Chayen in Tel Aviv regarding her April 1945 liberation by the 84th Infantry Division, the rail splitters, at the Salzweder concentration camp. Don Timmer, a U.S. soldier, served as an interpreter as General Eisenhower inspected the Ordruff concentration camp on April 12, 45. And there's a nice video, a featured video on the websites, on, on the museum's website about this. After nearly two hours in the camp, Ike's staff tried to get the general to leave. One of them said, Ike, we've got a war to fight. Timmer recalls Eisenhower's response. Don't bother me. I've got to get this. A former prisoner at the camp Andrew Rosner helped guide Eisenhower, who had brought General Omar Bradley, General Patton. Rosner notes, I never forgot how General Eisenhower kept rubbing his hands together as we spoke of the horrors inflicted upon us and the piles of our dead comrades. He insisted on seeing it all. He knew he wanted to have it recorded and filmed for the future. After his tour, Ike sent a famous cable to General Marshall at the Pentagon. The visual evidence, the verbal testimony of starvation, cruelty, bestiality, were so overpowering as to leave me a bit sick. I made the visit deliberately in order to be in a position to give firsthand evidence of these things if ever in the future there develops a tendency to charge these allegations to mere propaganda. In his diary, General Patton wrote of the camp, it was one of the most appalling sights I have ever seen. At 5.47 p.m. Eastern Wartime, radio networks flashed a bulletin that President Roosevelt had died. Ike, Bradley, and Patton had just returned to their respective headquarters when they heard the news. Before leaving Ordruff, Eisenhower had issued an order. Quote, I want every American unit not actually on the front lines to see this place. We are told that the American soldier does not know what he is fighting for. Now, at least, he will know what he is fighting against. We may not be warriors as great as Ike. We may not be prophets like Ike. But we today will testify and must continue to testify and to educate and to try to prevent future bestial behavior. But much more than a Holocaust Memorial Day observance or compelling book talk is required, as recent actions in the Mideast and activities in Europe show. May we be up to the task and build for God and for ourselves a world that prevents and fights evil. Only then will we have what he wishes for us, a world of peace. O shalom bim ramav hu ya shalom aleinu. May he who makes peace on high make peace for us. Now let's learn more about one of those visiting angels who knew what he was fighting for and what he was fighting against, who helped survivors in way phys ways physical, emotional and spiritual. An amazing person who operated un under unprecedented conditions to restore hope and inspire spirits. I have read the book. It's amazing. It's compelling. A chaplain, David Max Eichhorn, whose letters are preserved for us in a fine book prepared by his grandson and Greg Palmer. That's what we're going to hear about today. Yeah. Thank you, Rabbi, and thank you to Mike and the museum for, for hosting this. This was important to me to be able to do. The book, actually, The G.I.'s Rabbi, came out in 2004, but with the 70th anniversary, especially for the liberation of Dachau, just literally days away, I wanted to take the opportunity to tell this story, and, and that's what I'm doing today. 
I'm telling a story. It's not my story. Uh, I'm not an expert on World War II. I'm not an expert on the Holocaust. I'm not even an expert on my grandfather who died when I was 19 and by that time was already doing the usual New York Jewish thing of shuffling to Florida back and forth. So, you know, I would see him maybe once a year, twice a year for, for a period of a week or so. I am an attorney by trade. I'm here in D.C. I do national security work. I can talk to you about Freedom of Information Act, security clearances. Uh, I represent a lot of the CIA folks in Benghazi. We can have lots of interesting conversations, but we're here today to talk about my grandfather and what he went through. This book came about because of a program that I will show a clip of towards the end called The Perilous Fight. It was on PBS in 2003, America's World War II in Color, narrated by Martin Sheen, an incredible, phenomenal piece of work. Uh, some of it is online. And what was so amazing about it is when we think of World War II, we always think in black and white. And it's amazing how much color footage is actually out there. But it is silent color footage because of the technology of the day. So what happened was that Greg Palmer, my co-editor, was the producer of this program and had found references to my name over in the Library of Congress. Because when I came here in 1993 when the Holocaust Museum opened, if for those of you who have been there, and it's probably most of you, if you go down to the second floor, remember you start at the fourth floor, you go down chronologically. On the second floor is the wall of the righteous Gentiles and you walk around that and then there are four, I believe, television screens that show film footage of the liberation of the camps. The Russians at Auschwitz, the British, I think, at Bergen-Belsen and the Americans at Dachau and, and one other. And there is about a 45 second, obviously continually revolving film footage that has film of my grandfather leading the service. And so being the representative of the family in DC, I was tasked with, can you go get a copy of the film footage for all the other relatives? And we knew that this film actually had been a much larger film of about 45 minutes to an hour that had been filmed by George Stevens, which many of you may know of him, very famous Hollywood director back in the 40s. Uh, some of you may know his son, George Stevens Jr., ran uh, the Kennedy Center for many, many years. And we were searching for the entire film, which we never found. Nobody seems to have it anywhere. Uh, Stevens didn't know of it. Uh, the archives didn't know of it. Congress, Army, nobody. Uh, but we found bits and pieces of it along the way. And when I was looking at film footage in the Congress, Library of Congress, they had film footage of my grandfather, just said, Rabbi you know, meeting troops, and I would write down who that was, my grandfather. And that, when the PBS folks out of Seattle were looking for film footage for the program, stumbled across my name, contacted me via email, and said, hey, we're looking for more information. You know, what can you supply? The way this worked, because the film footage was silent, they would match up that scene, either with someone in it, if they could, or at least someone that was connected to something going on in the film footage. And then they would contact that family member or person if they were still around and say, do you have any letters? Do you have any documents? And then people would read from the letters as the film footage would be aired. So I actually, I'm in the program reading, I think 22 seconds worth of a letter from my grandfather writing back to the United States. And when we found, he had asked, so do you have anything? And I asked my mother who was alive at the time, do we have anything? I haven't seen anything. My grandmother, his widow, was still alive in her 90s uh, at the time. And she said, well, talk to your uncle. Uh, there were four children. My mother was the youngest, three older brothers. The oldest became a rabbi as well. He was a rabbi in Kingston, New York, just south of Albany, 49 miles south of Albany where I went to law school, actually. Uh, and he had retired here in Silver Spring. So I asked him, what do you have? And he had a stack of about a foot of personal letters that had been sent back from the theater to my family, to his wife and the kids, who were all seven, like about a year and a half, two years to seven at the time, and reports that were sent back to the Jewish Welfare Board. 
So you'll see references to the JWB around the museum. Uh, it was it operated in a different way back at that time. The Jewish Welfare Board would coordinate the rabbis that would work under military auspices. And you'd send reports back to this civilian organization in New York as to what you were doing. Uh, so we had typed reports to the JWB and we had handwritten letters back to the family and others. And we took all those including an unpublished autobiography that he had written in the late 60s or toward the late 60s, published works that he had done, a book called Rabbis in Uniform issued in 1962, which was all these veterans uh, from maybe mostly World War II, it might have been some World War I still around at that time, and others, other little accounts that had been in some books, and we pulled it all together into this book. And... What Greg and I did is then we would take references in his letters and we would drop it into footnotes. So we'd identify who he was talking to, who, who he was talking about, what, what scenery he was describing. And these are, for the most part, uh, letters that of course had to be censored as they would go through the war censors. So a number of them are, are say, somewhere in England, somewhere in France. And what I'm going to do today is I'm going to take you through this story and read these reports and letters, highlights of them chronologically, to give you a sense of what he was seeing and experiencing during that time. And then we'll end with some segments uh, where you could actually hear him speaking at Dachau. Uh, and then uh, hopefully there'll be some time and I can have some questions and answers to the extent that I can I can answer any of those. Now, he was born here in the United States, 1906, in Columbia, Pennsylvania, sort of in uh, the, uh, the Dutch country. And like a third of those who served in World War II, born of German immigrants who had come here in the United States in the early and late 1890s. And he had uh, one sister. He became a rabbi where he was ordained in Cincinnati at Hebrew Union. Uh, in 1931, and he was first assigned to Arkansas. I'm not sure how many Jews there were in Arkansas, but there was at least one because that's where he met my grandmother, uh, and, and he married her in 1935. And he was a, a very interesting man, I mean, at least from, certainly from when I read this, this is not a person that I know. I'll, I mean, I'll be very candid with that. This, this is a man in his his 30s going through some incredible experiences. I knew him as, you know, at this time he was, I want to say about 5'8", 135 pounds, and I knew him when he was much wider uh, back uh, when I was uh, an early child. Uh, and he, by that time he was in his, you know, when I was born in his 60, 61 or so. Uh, he volunteered actually to be in the Lincoln Brigade, which fought in the Spanish Civil War in the mid-1930s, uh, American units, and he was turned down and he was told, no, it would be better for you to stay here in the United States. You could do more good for us by helping bring attention to what is going on in Spain. Uh, but it goes to show you the type of person that he was. He, when he was in Arkansas, worked on a case for a Jewish defense lawyer who was representing a black man who was accused of murdering a white resident in the town. And he was acquitted. And it was apparently the first time that a black man had been acquitted of murdering a white person. And he was working on, on that case. He tried to get into the military uh, early on, but he was told no because of his vision. Uh, and then again, after Pearl Harbor, he again volunteered and was finally allowed in. He was put into the 15th Corps. And in the 15th Corps, this was an experiment. Uh, the, a little bit about the 15th Corps. In the nine months that it saw combat, it was part of the 3rd, 1st, and 7th U.S. Armies. And it ranged in size from one to six divisions and from 12 to 27 battalions of artillery. And all told, uh, they fought under, 27 different divisions fought under the 15th Corps, and at one point they reached up to about 150,000 men. They landed at Omaha Beach on July 10th, 
1944, just five weeks after D-Day. And they fought their way through Normandy, the Battle of Bulge, crossed the Rhine River, advanced into Germany. And half of the active rabbis in the country when World War II started, about 500 men volunteered. 311 of them, including my grandfather, received commissions. He started as a first lieutenant. Now, this was a significant number, and as you, even as I'm reading around here some of the same information that's in the book, uh, this was the, the greatest number of American Jews that had served as rabbis in military service. We traced it back to the Civil War where we had one rabbi, but he wasn't official, and he actually had to resign because of protests of having a Jewish chaplain in the service. There were only 23 that served in World War I, so this was a, a big deal that we had in World War II in both the Pacific Theater and the European Theater. Now, when he first joined, and he was told at first he couldn't, as I said, because of his eyesight, then they reversed that policy because a memo went out that said there had, they had done some research and they found that the German bullets weren't discriminating against people who couldn't see or who could see. So we might as well bring them into the service as well. He served first at Camp Croft, which is down in South Carolina. About 250,000 men went through Camp Croft for training. Uh, now it's a state park in that area. And he was there from 1942 to 1944. And the family was there with him. Uh, and they would lead Passover services and everything that would happen, as you would expect. And part of his duty was, of course, to console the men, and uh, there might have been some women, but obviously predominantly men, console the men and write letters back and forth and help prepare them to go into battle. And one of the experiences that he went through was there was this young man, Private Monty Moss, and Monty was having problems with his wife, who was back home uh, in, in some other location that it actually doesn't say. And apparently, Monty was feeling that his wife was sort of aggravating him uh, by continually asking him, uh, you know, what's going on? I need to pay this bill, and where are you? And, and uh, you know, I, why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you doing that? And it was causing Monty, who was about to go off to the European theater, some consternation. So my grandfather wrote to Catherine Moss, and he said to her, you know, basically question, you know, do you realize what you're doing by these letters that you're sending him that's causing him grief? You seem to be entirely oblivious of the responsibility that a wife has toward a husband. Now, I, I'm not saying that this is how things are. I'm just, I'm just a storyteller in this, and this is 1944. That a wife has toward a husband who is in the army, of the obligation which you have to cause Monty as little worry as possible so that he can be a good soldier of writing him cheerful, helpful letters instead of letters that cause him no end of mental discomfort, of trying to help him through this trying period of his life instead of uh, causing him worry and pain. And a week later, she wrote back to my grandfather, and she said, I've already written to my husband asking him to forgive me, which I received my answer. Believe me, I am grateful for receiving an, a letter from you concerning my husband. The next time I'll think twice before I write such letters as those I wrote to my husband. So it worked. Now, when he received orders to go to the 15th Corps, that was a significant deal because he was the first Jewish chaplain in the history of the army to receive an assignment of that nature. This was going to be an experiment to see as to whether a chaplain can function effectively at that, at such a high level with so many people. And in fact, during the time of the nine and a half months of combat, they never had more than two Jewish chaplains in the divisions. Most of the time, there was only one, and sometimes there were none. And his job was to serve those assigned and, and, and to the attached units which had no chaplains. So, for example, he was under primarily General Wade Hayslip at the time. General Patton was in the area, George Patton, obviously, who everybody here knows, not 
not here's some sissing, not the most friendly of those generals to, to Jews, uh, as we've heard over the years. So he would at times have to go serve over to Patton's uh, headquarters. And Patton had some very specific rules as to how he would conduct himself. So he had one rule that officers were not allowed to drive themselves. And my grandfather had a, uh, a, a, a enlisted man who was his driver who he didn't trust. He thought he was a horrible driver and he refused to let this guy drive him around. So every time he would drive himself in the Jeep. And every time he'd go over to Patton's headquarters, he'd be pulled over by the MPs and he'd be given a ticket or, or a fine of $50, which was a lot of money for 1944. So he came, my grandfather, and he complained to General Hayslip that this was going on. And so he went <coughs> and General Hayslip called General Patton. He brought my grandfather into his office. He called Patton and he, this is what was recounted. General, this is General Hayslip. George, you old basket, he bellowed into the telephone. Bad enough that you refuse to have a Jewish chaplain in your headquarters. And bad enough that you keep borrowing ours so often that you are interfering with his work here. But now, instead of appreciating the help, which our headquarters is giving you through him, you harass him by trying to impose the regulations of your headquarters on him. I have no objection to his driving his Jeep to your headquarters or anywhere else. So you old son of a bitch, you either have this fine revoked and instruct your MPs to lay off my officers or I will give a direct order to this Jewish chaplain that he is to ignore any future requests for assistance that may come from your headquarters. So my grandfather says, since I did not hear General Patton's response, I cannot quote it verbatim. However, I am certain it was equally forthright and uninhibited. The fine was revoked and he was subjected to no further annoyance by the Third Army MPs. Now, jumping back, <coughs> they went over in May of 1944, first to England, and they went over on the Queen Mary like thousands of other service mem members did. Queen Mary had been requisitioned by the British government as a troop ship. You can go, of course, visit it in California. It's a beautiful ship. Uh, they had 10 rabbis in one stateroom. He was very honored that he found out that at one point Winston Churchill had been in the stateroom, probably by himself rather than with 10 others or nine others. And he met a young lieutenant on the ship uh, who turned out to be young Lieutenant Eisenhower. And it was David Eisenhower, the general's son. Uh, and I had con I contacted, when I was doing this book, contacted the Eisenhower Museum up by Gettysburg to see if there was any records of this chance encounter. It obviously was more significant to my grandfather than it was to young David Eisenhower, who had no memory uh, of this at all. So they went through first in England and then went into the south of France and were going through. And one of the main missions that my grandfather had as the Jewish chaplain was to try and locate Jews who were still around in the south of France. So in August of 1944, he sent a report back to the Jewish Welfare Board. August 14th. Today I have come to the end of a search, a search which lasted five weeks and covered a blood bath mile. Because of the military censorship, I cannot tell you the exact name of the village where I am at the time writing this. Let it suffice to state that it is not too far from the French, French village of Le Mans, and that it is a little rural town in which only days ago was filled with the sounds of war and now is quiet in that strange sort of way in which all towns and countrysides are quiet after the sights and noises of warfare have proceeded on their fearsome way. A beautiful sunset fills the evening sky. This is real military reports, right? For those of you who have been in the military, this is, this is why the Jewish Welfare Board was a little bit different. A beautiful sunset fills the evening sky as I sit on a bench in the middle of a grassy pasture, balance my typewriter on two sawhorses, and recall a period of my search, my search for French Jews who have escaped the keen eye of the Gestapo and the crazy wrath of Hitler. Ever since landing on Omaha Beach July 10th, I've been asking people as I go through the cities and villages, are there any Jewish people here? Invariably, the reply has been a sad shaking of the head and a, no, monsieur, there are no Jews left here. And he talks about how he met his assistant, who was from Chicago, Corporal Irving Levine, and he comes running up to him. 
Chaplain, he cried excitedly. While you were gone, the most astounding thing happened. A lady and two children came into the area with a basket filled with eggs and pears to give to the wounded. The French have been wonderfully generous in sharing their pitifully small possessions with their American liberators, especially in their gifts to the wounded and their flowers showered upon the heads of the living and the graves of the dead. When this lady passed our Jeep and she saw the Magen David on it, she became very excited and she ran up and asked in the purest Yiddish, which I will skewer, bis du a yid. Chaplain, you could have knocked me over with a feather, I told her. I, sh I told her I was sure, and we've been chewing the fat in the French Yiddish and my best Chicago Yiddish ever since, and she's waiting for you at the Jeep. Now, it turns out this woman was uh, from Poland and had come to France when she was four, and her husband was a Polish citizen and had been in a concentration camp in East Prussia for two years, and she hadn't heard from him in seven months. And most of the fu people she had been with had been killed. Uh, she, her mother was still with her at 69, very poorly dressed, cried when they talked with her, uh, and was speaking in fluent Yiddish, saying that she had neglected to say Krishna, and now God had answered her prayers. So he says, in one sense, my search had ended. In another, it had only begun. For now I know there are Jews, fine, loyal Jews left in France. And as we drive the Nazis back and back, I shall seek ever more eagerly for this French, I, I can never pronounce this word, Shirat? Shirat? Anybody know what it is? Okay, I don't feel as bad. To let them know that American Jewry respects their courage and their fidelity and will do all within its power to restore to them their long-denied security and happiness and peace. Now, as I said, some of these letters are, are going back and forth to the family. Now, they're much more personal. They're not giving a lot of details about what they're seeing. And they're never talking about really as much the horrors of the war. But one of the things that they do express, and what began to be common from those who were serving overseas, <coughs> was not unlike this letter that Monty Moss's wife had written to him while he was still in training camp but letters that were coming over, you know, telling about the difficulties that they were having back here in the United States, which certainly were difficult, war rations, people having to move, you weren't, you know, gas and food, but certainly wasn't as difficult as what the soldiers and the Marines and the Navy and the Airmen were going and experiencing over in Europe. So that was becoming frustrating for those that were in combat as they were hearing what their family members were saying and complaining about back home. And the one thing that I always see and say about, as I'm reading through these letters, is that they're at the bottom and the core of it, you've got, this is, this is a guy. This is a guy in his late 30s who's never experienced war, who wasn't career military, and now is going through some horrific experiences and is trying to cope with them. At the same time, he's trying to really give solace to everybody else. So this is the person who's not supposed to be able to show emotion or discomfort because he has to make sure that those around him are, are secure in what they're doing. So he finally, he writes back to Dear Zelda, Johnny, Mike, Jerry, Judy, and all. This is August 19, 1944, somewhere in France. He goes, you asked me to write Zelda about what I see and about my work. My work can be described very simply. It is to hold religious services for and to give religious comfort to Jewish soldiers wherever and whenever I find them. In that, it does not differ in the slightest form the work I did in the States. The only thing which is different is the surrounding circumstances. I travel around in a Jeep and trailer, live in a pup tent, sleep on the ground, eat sometimes quite well and sometimes not so well. I've become quite adept at doing a high dive out of the Jeep from either the front or back seats whenever a bullet spitting plane with a swastika painted on it swoops down on the highway where I am riding. I've been shot at, bombed, and strafed so often that it has ceased to be novelty and it really is not as bad as the movies make it. In a another letter he is, that I'll get to as I get to it chronologically, he's talking about basically saying, I'll put it in 2015 terminology, you need to stop complaining to me about what's going on back home because this really sucks here over in France and Germany and I really don't want to hear of it. We don't know when the war is going to end. 
That was a question that was constantly asking. When are you coming back? When are you coming back? They're like, we have no idea. And if you look, as we look back now historically, it's very easy to see where the Germans were probably starting that the war was going to be over within a matter of months. They wouldn't be able to sustain it. But it wasn't so easy when you're on the ground in, in France and Germany. As they go through September 1944, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur come upon them, and they're still in France. And their, his job was to now hold services for the troops. So they are in this one city. First they get to Verdun. I'm sent to a city, Verdun, very famous in World War I. When I got there, I learned the Nazis had completely destroyed the Jewish community of this city and had converted its synagogue into a soup kitchen. A recent bombing had partially wrecked the building and it was in a sad state. The sanctuary was heaped with fertilizer, put there deliberately, of course, by the Nazis. I went to work on the synagogue, aid, aided by 10 German prisoners of war. And then he puts in parentheses, poetic justice, eh, what? Uh, and he said the Germans did a really good job cleaning it and that one of them even came up to him afterward and said that he felt really good to be able to help out after everything that had been done. In, in fact, this is what he said. One of the prisoners, a man well over 50, turned to me and said, Rabbi, helping with this task is giving me much inner spiritual satisfaction. While the great wrongs that have been committed can never be righted, this day's work is, for me, an act of penance for being a part of that people which has done such terrible things to the Jews and to the world. When Arab Rosh Hashanah approached, he said, much to his surprise, Jewish men and women in uniform began to pour into the town from all over. Some traveled 75 miles to get to the service, nearly 500 of them. The, the weather was bad, but the next morning the weather was blessed with a little bit better that had over 600 soldiers crowded into the synagogue. We had no chauffeur, so an army bugler blew the traditional blast on a good old GI bugle. Yom Kippur comes in October, and he's told by General Hayslip, chaplain, you will hold your Yom Kippur service in the synagogue in Loonville. Now, Never, as he said, was a military order dis more widely discussed by Jew and Gentile alike. Loonville and its synagogue were still in the hands of the Germans, two miles ahead of our most forward position. But we watched the battle reports as day by day went by and the Germans pushed out. And my grandfather and an assistant went into the town. And there they found an American military intelligence team of an officer and two men. And he said, they looked at us in amazement. What in hell are you doing here, chaplain? And he goes, I'm here because I've been instructed to hold a Yom Kippur service in this city tomorrow evening. And the intelligence officer wrote or said, well, if you can hold a Yom Kippur service with two Jews and three Gentiles, that will be it. For there will be no more American soldiers in this town by tomorrow night. This town is still in no man's land. It is not yet officially taken. Now, that next morning, and uh, this particular year, uh, let's see, uh, Yom Kippur was Tuesday evening and Wednesday. Early Monday morning, the Germans retreated about a mile west to the forest of Peroy, if I'm saying that correctly. And the citizenry greeted everybody joyous, joyously. They were liberated. In an atmosphere permeated with snipers, artillery shells whining ahead, over round and overhead, of bombs and strafing, he began to prepare to celebrate Yom Kippur. They had the local hotel owner and his wife, his daughter, help them clear the synagogue. All the while this was going on, the building was shaking from the concussion of exploding shells, and our nerves were being shaken further by the roar of shells overhead, both outbound and inbound. I didn't expect any Yom Kippur service to be held in Loonville. I did not think that anyone would get out of his foxhole and walk toward the enemy to go to synagogue, even on Yom Kippur, enough is enough. But he said General Hayslip's hunch was right and his was wrong. At sundown on Tuesday, the men came into Loonville. 
from all along the line, mostly from the 44th and 79th, division, 79th divisions, on foot, by jeep, and by truck. 350 battle grime Jewish fighters came to the synagogue for Kol Nidre. Their places in the line were taken by gentle comrades so that they might have an opportunity to worship. In they came, their faces coated with dirt, grim, brave, fighting sons of Judah. I tell you unabashedly that for the first time since I have been in France, I broke down and cried. No matter what I had seen before of the wounded, the dying, and the dead, I had managed to steel myself against tears, but this was too much. They had an army photographer there. There's a photo of it in the book. The army photographer said that the caption under the published photos would state his belief that no group of American soldiers had ever held a service in a religious edifice closer to the actual line of battle. Many of the men weren't able to remain for the entire service. They had to resume their place in line. It was, for many of them, the last religious service they would ever attend. A bitter firefight broke out almost immediately to drive the Germans from the forest, and about a third of them were killed. He said when he returned to his billet, the lieutenant, the military intelligence officer, thanked him for the great contribution that he had made to military intelligence. He said, I, I don't understand. And the lieutenant explained, the Germans could not fail to observe the movement of American vehicles and men through the streets to the synagogue. If they had had artillery at the edge of the forest, they would have been able to drop some shells right through the roof of the synagogue. And since they did not do so, we now know that they have withdrawn their artillery to the middle of the forest. Simple, isn't it? Meaning, hello, uh, we used you to be there, and if they had bombed you, we'd know where they were location-wise, but since they didn't, you're, they're further back than what we thought they were. And he goes, yes, but why didn't you tell me this before the service? And he goes, duty before friendship. Besides chaplain, if perchance you had refused to hold the service, I wouldn't have found out what I wanted to know. And if I had told you and you still would have held the service, you might not have been able to concentrate sufficiently on your sermons and other rabbinical duties. And my grandfather said, thanks for your kindly consideration of my spiritual welfare. <laughs> and he talks about, because we're piecing items together from reports and autobiographies where he would talk, you know, say different things in each of the different documents. We can piece it all together. So he talks in his autobiography that then in November he went to a dinner for General George Marshall by the brass in Loonville. And General, General Jacob Devers was telling General Marshall that he was having dinner in a town in which a Jewish chaplain held a synagogue service before the town was officially taken. And General Marshall and all the other diners laughed heartily. And at the time the happening was happening, those of us who were directly involved didn't find it quite so funny. So as I mentioned uh, in writing back to people, so in October of 44, writing back to the family, this one paragraph, don't expect me to guess when the war will end. I'm too busy trying to help win it to engage in foolish theorizing. The Germans nine miles well, that's the, the Germans nine miles from where I now sit, who at this very moment are engaged in sending quite large cannon shells in my direction, do not seem to be paying very much attention to all those predictions about the end of war being in sight. By early March, they cross into Germany, southern Germany. They go through Munich. They go to Nuremberg. He writes in March 31st, 1945, somewhere in Germany, back to the family. They crossed over 10 days ago. He held my first Passover service. What a contrast with the affair last year at Croft, at Camp Croft. We had 175 men. We had no food, just wine and matzahs. I've never had a Seder like it before and never will again, probably. There's a town three miles in front of us that is clearly visible from where we are, where the Jerry's still are, and that it's really getting the business. The division arrived in front of the town four days ago expecting no opposition. When the first troops entered, they received a joyous greeting from the local females who welcomed them by throwing hand grenades from the second story windows. Whereupon those Americans who were still navigable hastily withdrew and the artillery and the Air Force went to work. 
Never before have I stood and watched a town being blown off the map. It is not a pleasant sight. I feel a sense of horror and shame that mankind is still so perverted that such things are necessary. But I feel no pity, nor have I felt any pity in the other German towns whose ruins I have traversed, nor toward any of the Heron folk that I have seen suffering, except this morning when I comforted a little seven-year-old girl who had been shot by a stray German bullet. So again, remember, this is the grandson of Germans. And this is a rabbi. Uh, and I'm always torn by reading these types of accounts of what they were going through. Passover continues. They went into another German town and not many troops. And there was no Protestant chaplain available to hold religious services. So the Corps' Jewish chaplain, led a pro he, he led a Protestant and Jewish congregation in prayer in the Protestant church in this German town, the first such religious convocation of the 15th Corps on German soil. Hitler won't like that. When they move into Nuremberg on April 22nd, Sunday afternoon, the little jeep with the big Magen David entered Zeppelin Stadium. This is where, just 10 years ago, a quarter million Germans were cheering the Nazi party. And in the Jeep were one American Jewish chaplain, one American Jewish chaplain's assistant, one portable Haran HaKodesh, one Torah, which is property of the destroyed Jewish community of Haganau in Alsace, France, which was, if I'm remembering that this is the one, was in the Statue of Liberty for many years. This was given to my grandfather as a donation by the French, it was in the Statue of Liberty in the museum that was up in top. I don't, I don't know if the museum's open any longer. Uh, and it was then donated and transferred to the Battery Park Holocaust Museum uh, in Manhattan. So you can see it there. And we knew, I remember going when I was about seven up to the Statue of Liberty, and my mother identified the Torah that was in this glass case. It didn't say who it was from, but there were strings on the side of the covering and all the beads had been were missing from it and she remembered she had pulled them off as a child when she would play with them uh, in their home in in uh, Queens Forest Hills New York at the time back in the in the 50s 40s and 50s so they pull into uh, we also had so five Palestinian Jewish soldiers who had been captives of the Nazis for four long years they drove around the stadium, and the jeep halted before the speaker's rostrum, a rostrum surmounted by a resplendent gold leaf swastika, the rostrum from which de Fuhrer had again and again fulminated against democracy and the Jews. The soldiers got out of the jeep, and forming a guard of honor around the Holy Ark, carried it up the steps to the speaker's platform. They opened the ark, the Torah was taken out, they offered songs and prayers. At the end of the service, the Americans and the Palestinians joined hands and forming a solid ring around the rabbi, the ark, and the Torah, pledged renewed fidelity to the cause of Israel and the worship of Israel's God. Then the units of the 3rd Infantry Division came in and they put demolition charges attached to the gold leaf swastika and they blow, blew it sky high. So if you ever watch Judgment to Nuremberg, this is in the opening scenes of it. Amid the thousands of cheering beholders, none perhaps were more moved, deeply moved than the little group of seven Americans and the five soldiers from Palestine who were clustered around the little jeep with the big Magen David. They then moved into Dachau. So... Dachau was liberated on April 29, 1945, by the 15th Corps. Uh, another rabbi was there first, and then my grandfather replaced him on April 30th, and he stayed for a week until another colleague replaced him. If you've never been to Dachau, which is in a suburb of Munich, it's like going up to Bethesda. Uh, it's, think of NIH, the National Institutes of Health, as being Dachau, and all around it is the town of Dachau. 
and the people. You, you cannot go there and not believe that the town did not know what was going on. Now, whether they could do something about it is another issue, but that they knew what was going on, it would be impossible not to. Now, Dachau was the oldest of the concentration camps. It was a work camp. It was created in 1933. It had political prisoners, gypsies, uh, those who were opposed to the Reich, uh, and obviously a lot of Jews, Poles, etc. It was not a death camp, but obviously quite a number of people died there, but they were there for work purposes. He writes how he arrived on the afternoon of April 30th. We saw the 39 boxcars loaded with Jewish dead in the Dachau railway yard. 39 carloads of little shriveled mummies that had literally been starved to death. We saw the gas chambers and the crematoria still filled with charred bones and ashes. And we cried not merely tears of sorrow, we cried tears of hate. Combat hardened soldiers, Gentile and Jew, black and white, cried tears of hate. Then we stood aside and watched while the inmates of the camp hunted down their former guards, many of whom were trying to hide out in various places in the camp. We stood aside and watched while these guards were beaten to death, beaten so badly that their bodies were ripped open and innards protruded. We watched with less feeling than if a dog were being beaten. In truth, it might be said that we were completely without feeling. Deep anger and hate had temporarily numbed our emotions. These evil people, it seemed to us, were being treated exactly as they deserved to be treated. To such depths does human nature sink in the presence of human depravity. I think of all the, par and that's one big paragraph that he sent back in a report to the Jewish Welfare Board. I think of, of a man of God, of a soldier, of what they were witnessing, and even in before the time where they couldn't find Jews, but they didn't see anything, they just couldn't find them, to then come across Dachau. And you know, many of you, of course, probably know the story how Dachau was one of the camps where they, they made all the local survivors come in and, uh, not sorry, the locals come in and look and also was used to let soldiers, Americans, go, just like you heard the rabbi say in the beginning of this introduction. And they became immune to everything. And I can understand this, and not in the same analogy, but when I was an emergency medical technician during college and law school, you become immune to things that happen around you because you have to do what your responsibility is. And he talks about how he was sitting and talking to a professor the, uh, who had survived the camp, uh, and the man on the bed who he was sitting with died. And a doctor came along, saw the man was dead, covered his head with a sheet, and they just continued on with their conversation. He didn't even get up from the bed. And the professor said, poor fellow, at any rate, his worries are ended. And my grandfather wrote, it was a fitting eulogy. And he said, when they came in, Obviously, all the survivors were so happy to see the Americans. And he led one particular service, and he said hundreds of people crowded around him, kissing his hand and begging for an autogram, an autograph. He says it was a very embarrassing experience. I felt like it was I who should be humbling myself before them and honoring them for that which they had suffered and surmounted. He tells this one amazing story of SS man Gerhard Schmidt, Schmidt had been part of the Luftwaffe, a pilot. wasn't necessarily a Nazi. You know, Germans were forced to fight, and they didn't necessarily believe in the Nazi cause, but they were Germans. He was shot down and wounded, and he was assigned to Dachau. And he was one of the SS men who was helping Jews within the camp. When they fell ill, which was often a death sentence if you fell ill, he would smuggle them out of the camp to his house, and his wife and he would nurture and nourish them back to health, and then they would smuggle them back into the camp. Schmidt did not run away. He stayed. He took off his uniform, he put on his civilian clothes, and he went home. And three days later, after the liberation, he came back to the camp. And when he walked up to the gate, he was stopped by American guards and questioned, and he said who he was. And the Americans were about to shoot him dead on the scene until survivors of the camp saw him 
and rushed around him and surrounded him and prevented the soldiers from taking any action. And they were hugging him and kissing him and telling the Americans what he had done to save them, that he was a friend. And he said that uh, they were living in the headquarters of the Jewish compound and a few weeks later, because this is a report he wrote after, he learned that one night the Schmitz had quietly left the camp for an unannounced and unknown destination. It seems they had heard that some of the Germans in the nearby community of Dachau had vowed to kill the traitors at the first opportunity. I tried back when we did the book 11, 12 years ago, and I tried actually as recently as last year at the Holocaust Museum to find any reference to this individual. Emailed Yad Vashem, talked to the Holocaust Museum, can't find any record of this individual. I was hoping maybe some of the recorded conversations with survivors would mention him. I, I'm sure there's got to be a reference somewhere, but just haven't been able to find it. One of the scenes, if you watched Band of Brothers when they liberated one of the camps, and there was a very, very realistic scene of where a medic came running up to the soldiers to say, don't feed them. You can't feed them yet. You don't understand. And he discusses this. I had a very unpleasant experience soon after being assigned to the Dachau staff. The inmates, after liberation, left the camp, invaded the town of Dachau, took whatever food they could find from the greatly frightened Germans of the town, and proceeded to eat and eat and eat. Their emaciated bodies could not stand the strain. A number of them literally gorged themselves to death. The doctors ordered me to see it that no inmates got out of the sections at which most of the Jews were quartered. They actually had to close them and lock them in to prevent them from eating. Armed guards were placed around the fences to make sure that this order was obeyed. I, my grandfather, instructed the guards to frighten away the food bearers who were rushing for food by shooting over their heads. Reluctantly, I was compelled to tell the guards that they would have to actually hit one of the offenders in a non-fatal spot on his anatomy in order to protect the health of those in the compound. And this was done. The next fellow who tried to throw food over the fence got a well-aimed bullet through his leg, was taken off to the hospital, and eventually recovered from the wound. This drastic measure halted all further efforts to get any more food over the fence. They even had to fix bayonets to prevent anybody from dashing. He tells the story seven or eight years later. He's walking in the streets of New York City, and he's, he's over in the office by the Jewish Welfare Board, and this fine-looking young American soldier comes up to him, and he says, remember me? He goes, no. He said, you should remember me. I tried to kill you once. And he goes, well, that's something I ought to remember, as he laughed. And he says, but I don't. He goes, of course you don't. I was one of that mob of hunger-crazed people who tried to run you down at Ebensee, one of the camps. where. So he was one of the survivors, came back to the United States, and joined the military. So he talks a lot about this, and this is in some of the books on Dachau of George Stevens, as I said, and we'll see a little bit of the, the film. So George Stevens became a colonel in the Army Pictorial Service, and he was tasked to film everything that he would see, and he had black and white film footage, black and white film equipment that had sound, but because he was a motion picture director and famous and wealthy, he had color film equipment that was his own, and he would use that as well. And they were going to hold a service for the survivors of the camp in Dachau. And they found out that the Polish non-Jewish inmates had threatened that if they held a service, they were going to break it up by force. Because again, there's many non-Jews and the Poles, Polish non-Jews hated the Jews. So rather than cause a disturbance, they decided they were going to cancel the service in the square and hold it in the camp laundry, which only had enough room for about 80 people. And he didn't protest this because he thought the folks who were in the camp, they knew better than everybody else. And he would go by what they believed they thought was best. Stevens found out about this. And he went, hell no, are you? Absolutely not. And he spread the word through the camp, if anyone comes and tries to break up the service, you will be shot dead by the American military. And they held the camp. They held the service in the camp of about 2,000 people, if I'm remembering the number correctly. 
And he goes, as an added movie touch, Colonel Stevens requested that I teach some of the girls in the women's barracks to sing God Bless America at the service. And he did. He taught 15. He spent two hours teaching 15 Hungarian Jewish girls who didn't speak a word of English to sing the Irvin Berlin song, God Bless America, which you'll see. And you have 2,000 Jews and non-Jews. And the entire service, about 45 minutes in length, was filmed by sound. That's the one we couldn't find. While the service was in progress, a wagon load of naked dead came past the assembly on the way to the crematorium. Colonel Stevens ordered the camera to turn on the wagon and filmed or record, recorded a film of this weird, though temporary addition to the audience. And he says, years later, when he saw the film at a showing in Queens, the part of the girl singing God Bless America was there, but the wagon dead scene was gone. And he, he asked about it, and he, he was told, we had to take it out, the movie people explained. It seems so improbable that a viewing <coughs> audience would suspect that the scene had been staged. <coughs> Why don't I, well, we'll, we'll put on it now. I think that's at the good part of it. Two weeks later, American troops opened the gates of Dachau. Like Buchenwald, a concentration camp for political and military prisoners. Not a killing center like Auschwitz and Treblinka, but a deadly place for thousands nonetheless. Among the Americans at Dachau is Rabbi David Max Eichhorn, who conducts the camp's first Sabbath service, chanting a prayer for the dead. El Mole Rachamim, Shochen Bamromim, Hamse Menucha Nakona Tachas Kanfei Hashchina. A day of celebration shall this be for you, a day when every man shall return to his family and to his rightful place in society. Today I come to you in a dual capacity, as a soldier in the American army and as a representative of the Jewish community of America. As an American soldier, I say to you that we are proud, very proud, to be here, to know that we have had a share in the destruction of the most cruel tyranny of all time. The service ends with a choir of just liberated Hungarian Jewish women singing a song Rabbi Eichhorn has just taught them. The Gellhorn. We are not entirely guiltless, we the Allies. In our holy Torah, we found these words. Across them the roar boorit, the whole Yosh Yovel he to he him, be shavtemish el ahuzaso, be ish el mishpachto toshuvu, which mean proclaim freedom throughout the world to all the inhabitants thereof. A day of celebration shall this be for you, a day when every man shall return to his family and to his rightful place in society. In the United States of America, in the city of Philadelphia, upon the exact spot where 169 years ago, a group of brave Americans met 
and decided to fight for American independence, there stands a marker upon which is written these very same words. Proclaim freedom throughout the world to all the inhabitants thereof. From the beginning of their existence as a liberty-loving and an independent people, the citizens of America understood that not until all the peoples of the world were free would they be truly free, that not until tyranny and oppression had been erased from the hearts of all men and all nations would there be lasting peace and happiness for themselves. Thus it has been that throughout our entire history, whenever and wherever men have been enslaved, Americans have fought to set them free. Whenever and wherever dictators have endeavored to destroy democracy and justice and truth, Americans have not rested content until these despots have been overthrown. Today I come to you in a dual capacity, as a soldier in the American army and as a representative of the Jewish community of May 6th, I believe, and, and then was reassigned. Uh, as many of them, they thought they were going to be sent into the Pacific Theater, but fortunately, the war ended in August. He stayed in the European Theater on the continent. He was assigned to Austria. Uh, he was in charge of everything with resettlement in Austria and he came back finally in December of 1945. Uh, he was promoted to major. He was a lieutenant and a captain while he was there. Uh, he got a battlefield commission. Uh, retired from the reserves with lieutenant colonel rank. And as I said, then had his time between Forest Hills, New York and down in Satellite Beach, Florida, which is over by Cape Canaveral, the Kennedy Space Center. So uh, in fact, he was the chaplain for the Air Force Base locally there, so when the Challenger blew up in January of 1986 and Judith Resnick, a Jewish astronaut, was on board, he was asked to, to lead the services there. Uh, and he died in July of 1986, uh, just shy of his 81st birthday, about 80 and a half years old. Uh, I only had, I had, as I said, very little conversations. He would not talk about his time in the war. Uh, very much like those who, who served. Uh, it was very common. Uh, I found it a little bit strange, though, because he wrote about it. Uh, I mean, that's where we found the writings. Uh, he wrote about it in professional capacity in the role of his rabbi, but he wouldn't talk about it with his family members. I had one instance or one occasion when I was a freshman in college, uh, the last year of his life, I took a course on the Holocaust from a colleague of his, Rabbi, Rabbi Abraham Karp, and the, we had papers every week, and the paper was, why Germany? I mean, you know, why, why did the Holocaust happen in Germany, this industrialized, modern country with this wealth of history? And I wrote him, and he sent me a one-page letter back. I was a little disappointed by that, because I was hoping to not have to write much in my paper, and that I could <laughs> just copy from him. I think I only got about two sentences worth out of that letter that he sent back to me, uh, that he just gave me some basic history about it, uh, and before I had a chance to really have a conversation with him about anything else, he, he had already passed on. Uh, the book, to me, is, is an amazing account because it, it's not because he's my grandfather, but just because of the experiences that he had. As I said in the beginning, I don't really recognize this person there, he, like anyone else, had his faults. And the book is not intended to create or turn him into something he was not, but it was intended to be able to preserve a pocket in time and history that is so important for us to always remember, especially as we face those who deny the existence of what we just saw on film, uh, and cases of which I actually have worked against with Holocaust denialists amazing 
to believe. Uh, it's amazing, and I encourage if you haven't looked around the museum upstairs at the exhibit uh, to do so. Uh, Rabbi Good, who was on the Dorchester there, who was the stamp in 1943, was a friend of my grandfather. He talks about him a little bit in the book. Uh, I look around the wall, and Rabbi uh, Josh Goldberg used to come to our house uh, when I was a kid. I remember him. He was uh, in Queens. Uh, and there wasn't that many rabbis, obviously, were in the military, so they all knew each other. Um, a colleague of mine who was a federal judge in New York or went to the same university as me, uh, so as my parents' generation, his father served with my grandfather, and we uh, we linked up on, on these stories, and I sent him information about his grand his father that was recounted in, in the book uh, as well. Uh, it is a, a fascinating story to hear from the account of a soldier, a Jew, and a man, and, and each of those categories that he fits into is displayed in his letters and his reports back home. Uh, if there are any questions, I would be happy to try and answer them. I have copies of the book uh, for sale for $25. That's basically my cost. Uh, I don't try to make any money off, off of the books. I just want to spread the word. Yes, ma'am. Uh, what do you say? Uh, well, I'm trying, you're trying to have my memory. I still have the paper somewhere. Uh, he gave me a history lesson of of these events, I think even back hundreds of years, of just this, the, the part of it I think was how the, the Jews of that time were also sort of self-isolated, uh, which of course you see in a lot of with the ghettos in Poland, uh, Poland. And even though you had so many Jews who had served honorably in World War I in the German army, with the rise of Hitler and National Socialism and this fervor of nationalism where they created the, the notion of, of the Aryan, perfect Aryan person, which, I, you know, I always wonder with that, did any German ever, like, turn to Hitler and say, well, you don't look like anything of <laughs> what you're saying the perfect Aryan is? But I, I guess that was a death sentence, I'm sure, if you did it. Um, it, it wasn't, I, I said I was disappointed in the response. It didn't, it didn't give me... As, as much information. I wrote the paper, but I wrote the paper 30 years ago. <laughs> I think I got about an A minus on it, but I, but I don't remember honestly what it, what it said. Anybody else have, have any questions? Yes. No, so the question was whether any of his letters indicate uh, where he experienced anti-Semitism. The Dor Professor Doris Bergen, who wrote the introduction, actually talks about that. And she, she notes that, in fact, he, he really he didn't. He didn't discuss it. That they, they, they probably certainly encountered some when they were going through it. But certainly in the letters he wrote back home, he didn't talk about it. And even in the, at least the documents we have to the Jewish Welfare Board, he, he didn't discuss it. She talks about in her introduction, she gives a very uh, broad historical overview of the roles of Jews, especially chaplains, in the wars and a history of the 15th Corps, which is fascinating uh, to read. Uh, but there wasn't anything other than, I mean, even in that one encounter with Patton that he discusses, and either through the letters or at least I remember even from conversations from him. He was not a fan of Patton, and I'm sure it had something to do with the perception that the Jews had, uh, even in the service underneath him. Yes, sir. Um, I'm just thinking back from the question was, what did he express any type of attitude towards the German civilians beyond what I read? I think what I read, I mean, I highlighted the key portions of all the letters in the reports to give a sense. And, I mean, I don't remember any conversations with him about Germans, per se. Uh, but that one particular paragraph that I read that talked about the seven-year-old girl who was wounded and the bombing of this town, 
And I think it, that and the paragraph about when they first got to Dachau, so what happened to the guards who had remained, I think said it all. I mean, there, there, was, there was hatred. And, and to me, that when I first went through the letters, that struck me the strongest, again, when I'm thinking of this, this man of God uh, and the, what he had witnessed had led him to shed that role and be far more human and that being human meant you actually you didn't see some of these Germans frankly as human that they were so inhumane as to what had taken place you know, as a lawyer when I first started my career in the 90s I handled war crimes issues and human rights issues and even into the 2000s on some military cases out of Iraq with uh, Haditha and war crimes and I, I'm struck by the, the conversation that he had here about when he described the town being leveled. And of course, who was being leveled in the town was primarily civilians. And you, you analogize that to what we're talking about today. And even just literally this past week when the drone strike in January mis unfortunately killed two hostages, an American uh, and I'm blanking on where, I'm sorry. Italian, thank you, the Italian. Um, and this notion of this debate that's going on of being able to, what, what is the use of force and proportionality uh, and collateral conflict? And there we have laws on, on the books, and these laws have been pretty well settled for, for hundreds of years, literally, and certainly out of World War II. Uh, they haven't changed that much even since then. And it's it's very striking to me as, uh, as you look through what happened in World War II and this notion of how we conduct ourselves today. And I, 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 in fact, I think I even say at the end in my epilogue, I would have loved to have talked to him today about what he saw then and to equate it to how things are now. And the notion of 24-hour media and in many ways even because I represent a lot of military folks, the, the notion of how horrific it is for any one person to die and the impact it has on their family, but when publishing the names and photos and individualizing them in the newspaper like the Washington Post does, which I understand why they do it, how that impacts us here at home and the letters we might write back, or in this case now emails or satellite phone calls, uh, versus to what they were going through back at the time and how World War II would have been conducted so differently if it had been done with the technology that we have today. And I'm not sure if it would have ended up in, in the same way, with the same victory perhaps, uh, because it doesn't seem like we maybe could have been able to conduct ourselves in the manner we did the atomic bombs as, as one thing in dropping on civilian cities. Yes, sir. Zaid, Lithuanian. Yeah, so he, I, he uh, lived until I was 19. Correct. D youngest child. Um. Well, that's it. So now. This, the family, he was a reform rabbi, and he, quite frankly, was not very religious. And so, I mean, I don't think I would characterize my, I'm not sure if I would characterize my mother, who's, who's no longer around, as hard or soft. I'd say she was pretty much in, in the middle. Uh, we were raised on Long Island uh, in a reform capacity, and she would tell me the story uh, that she encountered with him back in the early 50s when she was probably about 10 or 12 and he stayed uh, working for the Jewish Welfare Board and working with Jewish soldiers and they were taking the train up to somewhere in like the Catskills area to meet with some of the troops and it was during Passover and he was eating a muffin <laughs> and my mom turned to him and said you know dad well, what are you doing you know you, it's Passover, and he goes, "What? It's a muffin." 
So apparently it was a difference between bread and, and a muffin, uh, so to speak. And he, he wrote many books. He was a very prolific writer. Now, most of the books are books that none of us would read or, frankly, want to read. I've tried to read through some of them, and it's, it's at such a high scholarly level uh, on the nuances of biblical times. But there's a couple of books that are actually very modern. One, his last book was Jew Joys of Jewish Folklore, published by Jonathan David Publishers, uh, which is a very big publisher of Jewish books up in New York. And that's much more of a tabletop, even coffee book. But one book he wrote was about uh, interfaith marriage in 1974. And he was a, and this, this is another thing that will tell you a little bit about him. He was way ahead of his time on interfaith marriage. He did not oppose interfaith marriage, and he thought that the notion of requiring someone to convert to Judaism was wrong. And what he wanted to do and did was just require the couple to promise that they would raise the children Jewish. And again, this is 1974. I mean, now it's a very modernistic view, but he was holding this view back in the, in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, so he was, he was way ahead of his time. I, I would say his oldest son, as I said, became a rabbi. Um, I think his, the influence of his father was significant on, in going that route, and he served in the army for a period of time, like uh, all males in the late 50s, early 60s, when, when there was a requirement to do so. Um, and the three brothers are all still alive. Uh, his one sister died, I think, in 1999, if I remember, and, and uh, so lived for until she was 90-plus years old. Um, we've gone and visited the home he grew up in in Columbia, Pennsylvania. Uh, the, the family was kind enough to let us come in uh, and look around, and there's on the sidewalk outside are the initials of the family, of the Eichhorn family. When they grew up there, he, her, his father, I said the German emigre, was, owned a clothing store in Colum Lan Lancaster. Lancaster? Columbia? I think Columbia, Pennsylvania. And the store is still there. It closed down in the 60s. The store is still there. Now it's a judo studio or something. <laughs> but if you look on the sidewalk out in front of it, it says Eichhorn out there. And unfortunately, Columbia, Pennsylvania has seen better days. It's been very hard hit by the economic downturn in the last decade, and so many of the stores are, are shut down. But we walked around the town and would talk to anyone who looked like they were older than, you know, say, 80 years old, 70, 80 years old, to see what they remembered of, of my grandfather and his family, more of the father that would have been my great-grandfather. And it was a small town. It was, they were very, very prominent in the town, and... Uh, we, we came up with some really, some really cool personal stories out of that. Anybody else? Carol? You can ask my father. So. <laughs> Dad, do you remember? Uh, they, they traveled, my grandfather and grandmother traveled a lot, and I don't think they ever went back to Europe that I recall. They would go down to Mexico and the Panama Canal and cruises. Uh, again, now, I don't remember many conversations, but my memories of my grandfather when we would go down to Satellite Beach, he, he was not the friendliest of to the kids, so to speak. We, we didn't, you had to be a certain intellectual level to interact with him. So he would be back in the back room with my dad and my uncles playing gin rummy and I don't know, smoking cigar pipes, cars, what was he smoking, and, and drinking rum, I think, if I remember. And we would be out with the, the kids and my grandmother. The other story that I, I remember, again, to give you a, a sort of sense of, of him, because he, he doesn't, again, this is why the person I knew didn't necessarily fit what the person writing these letters, which doesn't surprise me at all given the circumstances they were under. So when I was about seven, eight years old and we're down in Satellite Beach, I think, uh, the Ten Commandments was on television. Uh, you know, Charlton Heston playing Moses, parting the Red Sea. And I, this was, I don't remember this. My dad and my mother would tell me these stories. And I went up to my dad and my mom and I asked, did that really happen? Did, you know, did Moses really part the Red Sea? 
And they said, well, you're in the room with an expert. <laughs> Go talk to your grandfather. And I walked over there and, and you know, so, you know, we called him Papa. You know, Papa, you know, did that really happen? No. <laughs> so that, that, was, that was my experiences with him uh, as, as we grew up uh, in time. Anybody else? I can probably take another one before we end up. Well, I thank you. Again, if anyone would like a book, please. Thank you for coming. Appreciate it.